Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey, before we start the show today, I want to tell you about something brand new we're launching with our friends at Apple Podcasts called The Ongoing History of New Music Unlimited. For $3.49 a month, $3.49, which is less than the price of your morning coffee, you can now get access to the full archive of our shows ad-free. Plus, you'll get brand new episodes two days early and special bonus episodes. It's Ongoing History Unlimited, and it's available right now only on Apple Podcasts. One of the worst insults you can throw at any artist is to accuse them of selling out. The most basic definition of selling out is when the pursuit of money compromises, corrupts, or otherwise interrupts the pursuit of truth and beauty and all the purity and goodness that is supposed to flow from art. But that's an awfully broad definition, which can be applied in a billion different, highly subjective ways. At one extreme, some people believe that taking money for any kind of art is perverse and wrong. At the other, Anything and everything has its price, high or low, depending on the circumstances. And the world has changed. Making any kind of art costs money. Lots of it. Competition for attention among artists has never been greater. And we would like to think that great art inevitably and naturally rises to the top, but it just doesn't. In a true meritocracy, it would. But we all know that's not true. And ever since the internet started shaping the way we find and consume music, the value ascribed to music, that is, how much we're willing to pay for it, has dropped to near zero. Thanks to streaming and YouTube, almost all the music ever created in the history of humankind is pretty much available for free. But like I said, there are costs to making art, costs to making music. Musicians and those associated with its creation have a right to make a living. That's their labor. But where does the money come from? Well, from a lot of different places, as it turns out. The sources of this working capital may be distasteful to some. But if you want to be a working musician these days, some creative and philosophical compromises need to be made. What I'm trying to say is that selling out ain't what it used to be. Here, let me show you. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Sell out with me, oh yeah, sell out with me tonight. The record company's gonna give me lots of money and that's what things gonna be. From 1996, that's Orange County's Real Big Fish with Sell Out. Their lament at how money was corrupting not just the music business, but music itself. Interestingly enough, the band has made some good money licensing that song to several video games as well as a couple of TV shows. Now, that's not a knock against the band. It just underscores the difficulties of making your way in the world as a musician these days. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is a show all about selling out. We've covered this topic several times before, but things keep changing. The bar keeps moving, and the standards for selling out keep being adjusted. The adjustments in the last decade or so have been massive. More sponsorships, more endorsement deals, the rise in importance of band merch, a greater willingness by artists to play private and corporate gigs, and perhaps most of all, the now widespread practice of licensing music in a variety of ways. TV shows and commercials, movie trailers, soundtracks, and so on. I'm not saying any of this is bad. Much of it is born from necessity and a need to survive in a universe where fewer and fewer artists are making money from selling music in the old-fashioned way, which is to say music on pieces of plastic. Let's begin by defining the term sellout. Definition number one, a band sells out when they sign to a major label. They were cool when they were an indie outfit, but now that they're signed to a major multinational corporation, forget them, sold out. Definition number two, A band becomes a sellout when they allow their music to be influenced by the pursuit of riches. They're only in it for the money, and they will do whatever it takes to make as much money as possible. What form that takes is fungible, but you know it when you see it. Definition number three. A band is a sellout when they become too popular for the comfort level of some fans. They sell too many records and too many concert tickets and appear on too many magazine covers. Oh yeah, they're good, but they're just too famous now. And you don't like the new fans because 
you feel that they've stolen your band and they like your band just because it's trendy to like them. That rot has spoiled everything for you. For the most part, we're going to ignore this point because it's more of an emotional issue loaded with subjectivity. But then there is definition number four, and this is the dodgiest. A band has sold out when they allow their music to be used to sell a product unrelated to the music itself, letting a song be used in a commercial to sell something. Uh, Cars, candy, TVs, maybe even a poignant scene in an episode of a mainstream network TV show. Are we clear? Okay, let's proceed. The first time I remember noticing this sort of capitalism creeping into rock was in 1981 when the Rolling Stones launched an American tour. The band's business managers had some meetings with J. Walter Thompson, the ad agency. Was there a company willing to sponsor the tour? Well, it turns out there was. For $3 million, Jovan Musk, a men's cologne and toiletries company, bought the exclusive rights to the tour. Not only did the name Jovan appear on more than 2 million concert tickets, every time the tour was mentioned, so was Jovan, as in Jovan presents the Rolling Stones 1981 American Tour, or something similar to that. There were also promotional giveaways. Hundreds of pairs of tickets were allocated to radio station contests. And then we have all the merch. Rolling Stones slash Jovan t-shirts and jackets and hats and posters, a whole whack of stuff. The purpose of this? to show rock fans aged 16 to 34 that Jovan was a hip product because of its association with the Rolling Stones. And it worked. The Stones made money, and Jovan's sales went way up. This capitalist endeavor was not accepted quietly. It was, as you might guess, seen by some as crass and corporate. Rock and roll being co-opted by advertisers for shame. But because the deal worked so well for both the act and the advertiser, we were never going back. The Stones grossed $50 million on that tour, and Jovan saw a big spike in sales. But even before the Stones signed their Jovan contract, there was a selling out controversy with, believe it or not, The Clash. When they first appeared in 1976, they immediately had this image of populist punk rebels with working class socialist politics. Many saw what The Clash stood for as being completely incompatible with any kind of capitalism, and that included the record industry. Yet, as The Clash were building their For the People stance, they were the subject of a very fierce bidding war among some very large record labels. And on January 25, 1977, at the very height of punk rock in the UK, they signed a worldwide recording contract with CBS Records for £100,000. Other bands and other punks saw this as nothing less than a betrayal, an act of collusion with the enemy. Sniff and Glue, the big punk fanzine in the UK, declared that punk died the day The Clash signed to CBS. Okay, but let's look at it from The Clash's side. They were very, very poor. They were living in a rundown squat with almost no heat. They didn't even have any money for food. At one point, they actually resorted to eating the paste they used to stick up their gig posters like some kind of porridge. And it was a terrible contract. The Clash got completely screwed on touring expenses, recording expenses, and all sorts of other things. Then they had to justify what they had done to the punk community. The only way to get our music and our message out there to a worldwide audience, they complained, was to sign with a major label. We are going to subvert the system from within, they said. But no matter how hard the Clash tried to overcome this stigma, there were still people who hated them for, quote-unquote, selling out. Even after the band put out double and triple albums at cut-rate prices that deeply screwed the band financially when it came to royalties, they couldn't convince some of their constituency that they were, in fact, genuine socialist punks. Was the punk world being unfair? I think so. But like I said, selling out is completely in the eye of the beholder. R.E.M. was another band that took it on the chin from the hardcore faithful when they signed a big record deal. They started on a tiny independent label called Hibtone. That led to a deal with a bigger indie called IRS. And between 1982 and 1985, R.E.M. released five albums through IRS. During that time, they evolved from a frat boy campus party band to erudite, well-respected leaders in the hard-to-please indie community. Each new album sold better than the one before. But by 1987, 
REM came to the realization that they had done everything that they possibly could while remaining an indie band. And at the same time, lots of major record labels were always at the door with offers of big contracts. Now, this was agonizing. REM knew that if they signed one of these big deals, that they risked disappointing or even losing their core audience. But if they didn't make the move, their career was headed for a stall or maybe even a crash. Here's a quote from Peter Buck. In our own case, REM is always trying to figure out where the line is between commerce and what we do because it means something to us. We tend to bend over backwards to avoid commercial moves because we're afraid of diluting the essence of the band. But we also realize that we're part of the machine. Like many other bands, we started out doing something we love, learned that it could be something that makes money, and now we have to decide what the difference is between doing it for its own sake and doing it because it's a potentially profitable career. R.E.M. also wanted off the endless indie band treadmill of recording and touring and recording and touring. No one wanted to be on the road for months and months at a time anymore. A big deal would allow them to slow down and take their time so they could make better music in the future. So it came to pass that on April 8, 1988, R.E.M. signed with Warner Brothers and took home a $6 million check. Here's what Michael Stipe said at the time. IRS's distribution deal, their ability to get REM albums into record stores, had gone as far as it could, and it was time to move on to someone who could get the records out worldwide. Translation? We make music so that the music can be heard by as many people as possible. Warner Brothers is helping us do that. What's the problem? Well, at least they had a sense of humor about the whole thing. Why do you think that first record for Warner Brothers was called Green? So, did R.E.M. sell out even though they maintained complete creative control over their music? Again, that's up to the beholder. We can also look at the experience of Husker Du, the Minneapolis hardcore band who also signed with Warner. And then a few years later, Sonic Youth, going from America's most beloved indie band to signing with a major label. They made those moves exactly for the same reasons as R.E.M. The economics of being an indie band just didn't work for them anymore. They couldn't afford to stay indie. So if they wanted a longer career, if they wanted to be reliably paid for their work, if they wanted some downtime between tours, and if they wanted more people to hear their music, then selling out by signing to a major label was the only solution. And because Sonic Youth did it, so did this band called Nirvana. In fact, they signed to the same record label. But as all this was happening, there was the great outrage surrounding a 1987 TV commercial. Okay, wait, hang on. We got to back up. Artists had been licensing their music to sell products for years. Back in late 1963, a very young Rolling Stones wrote a jingle for, wait for it, Rice Krispies. Brian Jones wrote the music and Mick Jagger sang it. Here it is. Wake up in the morning, there's a snap around the place. Wake up in the morning, there's a crackle in your face. Wake up in the morning, there's a pop that really says, Rice Krispies to you, and you, and you. For on the milk and listen to the stand that says it's nice. For on the milk and listen to the crackle of that rice. Get up in the morning to the pop that says it's rice. Hear them talking, Chris. Rice Krispies. Or how about this? In 1969, David Bowie appeared in a commercial for ice cream. The brand was called Love, and the director of the commercial was Ridley Scott. Yeah, the famous movie guy. Fast forward to 1980 when the Beach Boys' Good Vibrations was used in an ad for sun-kissed orange soda. Good, 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 good vibrations. Sun surfing excitations call for sun-kissed good vibrations. Bubbly orange jubilation. Sun-kissed orange soda takes sensation. Sun-kissed is giving up good vibrations. Now, 
Now, that's obviously not the Beach Boys singing, but someone somewhere drew the line at using the actual song in the ad. So a cover was used, but the association was clear. Oh, here's my favorite. Lou Reed, easily one of the most uncompromising artists in the history of rock, appeared in a 1984 TV commercial for Honda Scooters, along with his 1973 hit, Walk on the Wild Side. Hey, don't settle for walking. All those commercials passed with, um, well, let's say minimal fuss. But then in 1987, a niche athletic shoe company called Nike launched a campaign for Air Revolution, their new line of shoes. And it immediately ran headfirst into a storm of outrage. See if you can figure out why. Do something. Anything. See the problem? Instead of an artist singing a jingle, instead of getting someone to cover a famous song for a commercial, and instead of using a snippet of a song that doesn't feature vocals from the artist, here was the real thing being used to sell a product. And this wasn't just any artist. This was John, Paul, Ringo, and George. And what's more, this sacred call to action that John Lennon wrote in the 1960s was being used to sell shoes. At first, Nike was going to use another song called Revolution by the Georgia Satellites. But then after the filmmakers were done shooting their bits, an editor from Wyden and Kennedy, an ad agency, dropped in the Beatles song instead. Wyden and Kennedy was behind this. They were based out of Portland, Oregon, the same city as Nike. And Nike, again, at that time, fairly niche, had never done a big major television buy. And because Reebok looked like they were about to eat Nike's lunch, Nike and their ad agency pushed for something that would really, really move the needle. Why did and Kennedy did some negotiating with Michael Jackson? Because on August 15th, 1985, he'd bought a huge chunk of the Beatles' publishing catalog right out from underneath Paul McCartney's nose. So he, not the Beatles, had the hammer in this situation. But there was also Yoko Ono's involvement. She helped broker the deal because she thought it would help bring her late husband's music to a new generation of fans. Nike did pay, and it was a licensing fee somewhere between 7 and $10 million, a ton of money for 1987. Meanwhile, the other three Beatles went ballistic. They did not want their music to be used and defiled in such a manner. So they sued Nike for $15 million for using the song without their permission. The whole matter was settled out of court, but not before the ad campaign had run its course, setting Nike on the road to becoming a multi-billion dollar shoe company. And in the history of advertising, Nike's revolution spot has gone down as one of the most important and influential of all time. It did start a revolution, one that we can see at every turn today with the use of music to sell products and services. After this, there was no turning back. This brings us to the Clash and the Levi Jeans commercial of 1991. How did that end up happening? I mean, the Clash had been against this kind of exploitation of their music for years, turning down all kinds of offers from Dr. Pepper and British Telecom and a few others. So what happened in 1991 that made them think, yeah, we can use this song to sell jeans? The truth was, by the beginning of the 1990s, the members of The Clash were quite skint. They had never really capitalized on their fame and influence. And six years after their breakup, money was, well, tight. Levi's approached the band with the idea of using Should I Stay or Should I Go? The group punted the decision to Mick Jones, who was the principal creator of that song. And it turns out he was okay with it. Hey, listen, Levi's are working-class pants, right? Here's a cut that appeared on British TV in 1991. Imagine a bunch of people getting hustled at pool by a young kid wearing jeans with the clash in the background. Darling, you got 
to let me know Should I stay or should I go If you say that you are mine I'll be here till the end of time So you got to let me know Should I stay or should I go The interesting thing is what happened next. The song was reissued as a single in conjunction with more promotion for Mick Jones' post-Clash project, Big Audio Dynamite. And the combination, the TV show, The Clash's Heritage, and Big Audio Dynamite, worked like a dream. Big Audio Dynamite got a big push, and the reissued single went all the way to number one in the UK, The Clash's first and only number one hit. To let me know Should I stay or should I go The Clash, rocking the Boat by quote-unquote selling out. That was 1991. The Clash had their bank accounts topped up, Levi sold jeans, and The Clash benefited from renewed interest in their music. To many involved, it was a win-win-win. As the 90s rolled on, these sorts of licensing deals became more common. We'll pick up that thread in just a second. We're examining the nature of an artist selling out, a term that's gone through a lot of revisions over the last 50 years. The goal is to determine how and why so many songs are being used for commercial purposes these days. We've talked about The Clash, The Rolling Stones, David Bowie, and Lou Reed, how they ended up making these sorts of deals. And then there are a few other groups that tread carefully or even backwards into this area. In 1996, a song by the dream pop band Lush ended up in a TV ad for the Volkswagen Passat. I am safe and sound. I'm motion-censored, watchdog, doorman, security cammed, and dead bolted. So how do I get out? On the road of life, there are passengers, And there are drivers. The next big shock was another Nike commercial. In 1998, I turned on the TV to see Bittersweet Symphony by The Verge being used in an ad. This, as the song, was still on the charts. What was going on here? By this time, The Verve had lost a copyright challenge to Abco, the company who administered the work of the Rolling Stones. It's a very long story but it had to do with the Verve using more of a sample from an old Stones-related cover than they were supposed to. Abco sued, got the rights to Bittersweet Symphony, and immediately licensed it to Nike. The campaign is called I Can, which was a take on the whole Just Do It theme. Here's the audio of the commercial that debuted during the NFC Championship between San Francisco and Green Bay. It was January 11th, 1998. tell you that the Verve hated that. The Verve's fans hated that. But there was nothing anyone could do because Abco owned the song and could do whatever the hell they wanted with it. And they did. The spot was aired all over the place, including MTV. And then came Moby. A plan was hatched by him and his manager that changed the relationship between music and advertising forever. They were looking for ways to get Moby's music out there. Radio stations and video channels weren't all that interested in what Moby was doing, so they had to figure out something else. 
Instead of turning down offers to license songs from Moby's new album for TV commercials and TV shows and soundtracks, they embraced them. They listened to everyone. The thinking was that the more people who could hear Moby's music in more places, the more it would sell. And this turned out to be a brilliant strategy. Once songs started showing up this way, the album started selling at a rate of 150,000 copies per week. Nine of the songs became hit singles. And by the time things settled down, all 18 tracks from the album had been licensed for something. The album itself sold somewhere north of 10 million copies. The album was Play, and it turned Moby from a cult DJ into a worldwide star. Remember this from a Bailey's Irish Cream commercial? That's where I first heard it. Some people have never forgiven Moby for his license everything strategy with the Play album in 1999 and 2000. Remember the time when someone tried to sell Moby's soul on eBay? You've got an empty jar full of air. But there was no doubt that if applied carefully, this strategy could work. Sting licensed some music for music in a Jaguar commercial. He couldn't get radio to play any of his solo music, but once it was in the Jaguar commercial, it became a hit. Even Led Zeppelin was persuaded to license the song Rock and Roll to Cadillac for a series of ads. Why would they do this? Well, first, the internet. The beginning of the 21st century was when record sales went into free fall following the introduction of Napster and all the other file sharing programs. Artists needed to find alternate sources of revenue to replace what was being lost to piracy. Secondly, being a musician is ridiculously expensive. And with record labels cutting budgets for things like recording and touring, the money had to come from somewhere else. In addition to mundane things like food and rent and utilities, you have to think about the van, gas for the van, maintenance for the van. You need gear like guitars, strings, sticks, heads. Recording costs money. Oh, sure, you can do something by yourself on a laptop. But remember, this is 2000, 2001. And Also, there comes a time when you really do need proper resources to make the music sound the way it needs to sound. You want a manager. You want someone to look after the business end of things so you're free to be a musician. you got to pay him or her. Maybe you need someone to look after your website. And what about all the merch? Artists have struggled with these sorts of everyday issues for as long as, um, well, for as long as there have been professional artists. I mean, Shakespeare didn't make a lot of money. He and many writers like him were able to work because of the generous support of patrons, wealthy admirers, who gave him enough money to live while he continued to write and produce plays. Michelangelo's sponsors had names like Pope Julius II and Leo X. Emperor Joseph of Austria looked after Mozart. And today's musicians have patrons as well, except that we call them sponsors. Some sponsors buy equipment, guitars, strings, amps, mics, drums, drum heads, whatever, In exchange for free gear, a band will thank the manufacturer in the liner notes of their albums. Some deals will come with endorsements which appear in the pages of music magazines, everything from Rolling Stone to Modern Drummer. They'll appear at conventions and trade shows, plugging their involvement and singing the praises of the company. Most fans have never really had a problem with these kinds of endorsements. Somehow it's okay for, say, Gibson to give a guy a guitar in exchange for appearing in a magazine ad or something. Where things started to get weird was when bands started signing up sponsors for concert tours. And that brings us back to the Rolling Stones story with Joe Vann in 1981. As time went on, staging a major tour required bigger and bigger amounts of capital up front. See, somebody has to come up with the money to design the stage, negotiate the contracts, hire the crew, get the trucks, book hundreds of hotel rooms, reserve airline tickets, secure insurance, all before the band plays a note and sees a single cent in revenue from the tour. And each tour has to be bigger and better than the last one. So before too long, corporate sponsors were seen everywhere. Budweiser, Pepsi, Tommy Hilfiger, Honda, Citibank. And then there was U2's massive 360 World Tour, one of the most expensive tours, maybe the most expensive tour ever staged. It was underwritten by Research in Motion and BlackBerry. U2's hookup with Research in Motion and BlackBerry for the 360 World Tour 
wasn't their only foray into corporate sponsorships. Remember the special U2 iPod that Apple released? Hey, and for a while, the icon for the music app was actually a silhouette of Bono and a microphone. After their flirtation with Research in Motion, U2 went back to Apple. Remember back in 2014 when the album Songs of Innocence was automatically pushed to everyone's iTunes account? Someone should have maybe thought that one through. This sounds a bit weird, but I once ran into Bono and I asked him about the Apple deals. Apple, what an amazing company. Um, They make beautiful objects, you know. The job of art is to chase ugliness away. The iPod is the most attractive object art in music since probably the electric guitar. We're actually fans of Apple. I'm a fan of Johnny Ivers who designed the iPod. Just wanted to work with them. The other sense was that music is changing shape and is always changed uh, by technology. Going back to Jimi Hendrix stepping on a fuzz box, you know, an overloaded printed circuit and making that extraordinary wild feedback and that, you know, the, that distorted sound of his, that's technology. Technology changes music. Hip hop is invented because of technology, a sampler, a way of sampling old soul records and, and that's technology. And so you, you put your head in the sand uh, on technology at your peril. It's like people shouting at Bob Dylan, you know, calling him Judas when he plugged an electric guitar in and he was supposed to be a folk, folky. Well, we're excited not just about the objects that they make, but their commercials. You know, we like that team. And we're savvy enough to know that Vertigo is not the biggest pop song in the world. You know what I mean? It, it becomes a pop song when you hear that riff over and over and over again. You think, wow. And so we really we wanted to get that not just on the radio, but everywhere. We wanted that riff. We wanted Edge's guitar everywhere. And so when we partnered up with Apple, we were able to piggyback a huge marketing spend that we could never afford. Now, people have offered us fortunes to be in commercials before. And... Um, um, we couldn't find something that we felt was cool because in the end it's about doing you know cool things you don't want to embarrass your fans and uh, we did this for nothing as it happens but um, we weren't, it wasn't against our religion getting paid for by a, by, a, by a corporation we're already in a corporation Universal Music a corporation we're on a corporation now talking to you there's corporations everywhere we're a corporation we're a gang of four and a corporation of five we often say we take care of business we've always been good at it and um, you know proud proud of that with the uh, gift comes the the bodyguarding of that gift and it's not just huge acts that have relied on sponsorships. The Warp Tour, which featured the most indie of indie and punk bands, could not have happened for all those years had it not been consistently underwritten by a shoe company. But because vans are considered cool by that crowd, there wasn't too much squawking about it, despite the politics and left-leaning tendencies of many of the acts that played. Listen, somebody had to pay the bills. Taking dozens and dozens of bands on the road for an extended period of time throughout a summer is hideously expensive. But given the generally positive image of the sponsor, most punk fans felt that this was a compromise worth making. And besides, a sponsorship kept ticket prices low. So wasn't that a noble thing? Back in 2002, Incubus took on Honda as a sponsor for a tour. Here's what singer Brandon Boyd had to say at the time. Taking on a corporate sponsor allows a band like us, who's not the biggest band in the world, but is somewhere sort of hovering right above the underground and right below the mainstream. It gives us the opportunity to do a couple of things that are very important to us. Number one, have $35 tickets in arenas, which is unheard of. I paid more than that over 10 years ago to see the arena shows that I went to. Number two, it allows us to take our own PA, our own monitors, our own production, so we can put on a bigger show. So... Hard to find fault in that, isn't it? More on the contentious topic of selling out coming up. 
Let's talk more about the concept of artists selling out. It used to be that appearing in a TV commercial was the kiss of death. You may remember stories of famous celebrities agreeing to do a commercial in Japan because, well, they figured that no one would ever find out. Harrison Ford did a beer commercial this way. Arnold Schwarzenegger plugged an energy drink. Brad Pitt was hired by a number of Japanese companies. And Madonna was persuaded to do a coffee commercial. I'm pure, June legend. Of course, you know, that wasn't too much of a surprise given that she'd had a big sponsorship tie up with Pepsi in the middle 1980s. Here are a few more musicians in TV commercials Iggy Pop for car insurance. Fast flying bird, five letters. Swift! To place something over or upon for protection. Cover! That reminds me, SwiftCover.com car insurance is 100% online. You can get a car insurance quote in just 60 seconds. That rock! Get a life. Get Swift covered! I'm not covered over here. ABBA for an electronics brand in Australia. There is so much more to measure. Ringo Starr and the Monkees for Pizza Hut. Nice little twist at the end of this one. I'd do it in a second. The fans will dig it. They've waited long enough. I've just got to get the other lads to agree. I think I can convince them. I'll say, lads, the time, the time has, has come. come. To eat our pizza, crust first. Good idea, Ringo. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Stuffed crust pizza from Pizza Hut with cheese baked into a new thinner crust. You'll want to eat it crust first. Now with free garlic dipping sauce. Wrong lads. Large is $9.99. And how about this one? Johnny Lydon, Mr. Rotten from the Sex Pistols for a brand of butter. Do I buy country life butter because it's British? Do I buy country life because I yearn for the British countryside? All because he's made only from British milk. No, I buy country life because I think it tastes the best. It's not about Great Britain, it's about Great Butter. So, are these examples of selling out? Again, pretty subjective. But if you're the artist and you're looking to maximize revenue while you can, then no, it's just good business. You're capitalizing on your brand and influence. New money flows in so you can keep making music, which is increasingly expensive, if not a money-losing thing. Or maybe you just needed to survive. Back in the day, it was really simple. You made a record, you played some gigs, and you cashed the checks. After all the bills were paid and everybody had their cut, what was left over was yours. But as the music industry evolved, things have become more complicated and much, much more expensive. On part two of our look at the concept of selling out, we'll get deeper into the process of licensing music for products and the growing trend of artists selling their catalogs outright. Meanwhile, check out all the previous episodes of the ongoing history of new music that you can find through any podcast platform you want to use. There are hundreds of episodes to choose from. If you're looking for a daily hit of music news and information, there's my website, a journal of musical things.com. It's updated every day and comes with a handy free newsletter. We can meet up on TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and all emails should go to alan at alancross.ca. 
part two of Selling Out next time with the ongoing history of new music. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 